So, welcome both of you. Uh, I'm excited for us to continue this conversation. As I mentioned, we just had a panel talking about the challenges from an end-to-end -end processes standpoint. Uh, we touched a little bit on supply chain or some of the more complicated, you know, finance, procure to pay functions. So we're definitely excited for you guys to have this chat now and, and, and share what some of the success stories uh, and strategies are behind it. Okay, terrific. Uh, Marie, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so just leading off, I'm Tom Wilde, the CEO of Indico. And just 15 seconds for context, Indico is an intelligent automation solution focused on unstructured data, helping our customers automate critical workflows and processes involving uh, email, text, documents, et cetera, that flows through major enterprises. Um, I'm joined today by Matthew Schenk, as Marie said, Director of AI and Automation at PNC Bank, which is, if you've watched the news over the last year, uh, PNC has continued to, to grow and, and get bigger with a number of key acquisitions. So uh, welcome, uh, Matt, thanks for, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Well, maybe you could start, you know, I think one thing that, that jumps out at me anyways is um, your title itself, right? Which is this notion that AI and automation are, are sort of closer together now than ever, in, in your case, actually in your portfolio. Uh, we'd love to hear a little bit more about your responsibilities at PNC and, and some of the rationale for, you know, constructing, you know, your portfolio that way. Yeah, so, um, you know, really four years ago-ish, a little longer, um, our executive committee, um, you know, decided that, look, we think artificial intelligence and automation, you know, together uh, are, you know, key strategic priorities. Um, you know, there's a lot of business press, popular press about the specter of, of AI automation, particularly in the services sectors and, and the like. So, you know, the executive committee sort of got together and said, look, we want to do this. We want to do this the right way. So we want to build out uh, a centralized uh, team uh, that sort of leads the enterprise through this. Um, so, you know, we, uh, the first thing in my background is not in any of this. It was actually in the business. So I left the business to, to do this because I thought it'd be an interesting uh, way to learn the bank and, and the like. But um, so, you know, we sort of started with, with defining AI, which, you know, I think as everyone probably knows is an ever evolving uh, definition and one with uh, still a tremendous amount of ambiguity, but uh, we define it really, really broadly. Um, and so, you know, our portfolio, as Tom, you called it, really ranges from everything from, you know, back office, middle office, process automation, um, you know, using things like robotic process automation, uh, document intelligence or document AI technologies, uh, all the way up through you know, the application of, of machine learning or data science to data analytics uh, to, derive, to derive analytical insights uh, from, from structured data. Uh, and then everything in between. So, you know, we do virtual assistants, et cetera. So, you know, we did this because um, at the end of the day, this is about solving business problems. Uh, and, you know, our view is that, you know, there's not any single technology that is gonna help us solve, uh, you know, any specific business problem. Uh, let alone ones that are, of, you know, sort of critical strategic importance, like, you know, uh, supporting the automation of the back office or better enabling our employees with data and analytical insights to be more effective at their jobs or redesigning customer experiences broadly. So, so we just scoped it really, really broadly. And it's sort of evolved over the course of the time as, as the technologies have continued to evolve and the definitions of AI has continued to evolve uh, and the like. So. Yeah, and interestingly, not only do you have sort of a set of back office use cases, you actually have a back office as a service set of use cases where in some cases you're providing certain uh, workflow uh, on behalf of, of your customers. And I think in the small business segment, if I'm correct. Yeah, so, absolutely. So um, I don't know if people realize this, but uh, you know, banks, particularly in sort of their cash management or treasury management businesses, as we think about them, actually do a tremendous amount of sort of outsourced document processing. Um, you know, the biggest example is our lockbox product, which is traditionally uh, processing checks on behalf of corporate institutional customers. And, you know, those little remittance slips that uh, people used to send in the mail along with their checks. So we do, you know, uh, close to 200 million check processes. Their checks processed a year 
Uh, but that's one example of many, many other uh, sort of document type processing businesses that uh, are products that we have um, largely in the commercial uh, and corporate institutional bank, but also, you know, banks in the context of, uh, you know, uh, consumer lending, where a lot of consumer loans, particularly mortgage loans are originated by banks and then sold to investors, but banks retain those servicing rights. So we do a lot of of the ongoing document processing. So it's an operational type business um, for folks. So yeah, tremendous number of documents flying through banks. And, uh, you know, even when we don't sort of hold the risk of, of loans or, or the like on sure. the balance sheet. So interestingly, you know, you, you haven't come over from the business side in, into this uh, position. Um, and you guys have some experience now behind you in terms of automation, especially at scale, right? At a, at a place like PNC. What are some, you know, two or three kind of uh, maybe surprises that you would highlight uh, about deploying automation at, at an uh, enterprise at the scale of PNC, you know, from when you took the job to where you are now? <laughs> um, I probably naively took this job thinking that like, oh, we're talking about back office automation. This will be really easy. We'll go look at the processes and, you know, go build some solutions and I'd uh, be done. Uh, I mean, I think the biggest surprise is um, how hard it is actually to automate uh, the back office at a, you know, a service sector company. Um, you know, and that's sort of the result of, there's a tremendous amount of legacy technology uh, that's been sort of purchased and built over the course of time. Uh, you know, there's a tremendous number of documents uh, that, you know, flow through a bank that uh, have unstructured, semi-structured sort of data in them uh, that we have to manually extract by and large today. Um, you know, and if we could digitize that, it'd be really easy to just move the data around and straight through process things, but uh, you know, easier said than done. Um, so one is, you know, it's, uh, it's really hard. It takes sort of a, a process mindset where you sort of redesign process end to end but do so in the context of modern technology. Um, but, you know, it also requires that you update a lot of legacy technology, uh, you know, uh, core applications that have been at some banks for, you know, 30, 40, uh, 50 years when you think about some right. of the main some green screens that, still out there, right? I mean, that's, uh, the, the reality is that there are green lot screens. Of still running. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so yeah, I mean, there's just a, a lot of legacy challenges with technology and with data that make it, uh, you know, it's not as easy as folks uh, want to sell it to you as is our our experience. It takes years and years of of work, uh, not just with AI, but with core application infrastructure and and data. So maybe zooming in a bit on the unstructured challenge, because you guys have, have done a lot of work with this over the years. Um, how have you thought about, you know, what, what have been some of your learnings from from your initial uh, approaches to automating unstructured and how did that evolve to, to where you are today? You know, how did you apply some of those learnings to define, you know, what, what are you looking for um, in solutions that can help you uh, in that category? Yeah. Um, you know, the biggest, and so we, you know, as I said earlier, we've, we've got pretty big document processing businesses and we, we identified very early on if we actually wanted to automate sort of back office functions, we're going to have to digitize this data as early in a business process as possible so that we could just then sort of move it around via APIs and, you know, more traditional technologies. Um, so when we started our journey, we sort of started it with RPA and then sort of, you know, we'll call it Doc AI uh, in parallel. And we had sort of fit for purpose technologies, one for RPA, uh, one for uh, Doc AI. Um, you know, as we as we started down that road, we, we realized very quickly that, and this was four-ish years ago, uh, that the Doc AI technologies uh, and bit, frankly, the data extraction uh, approaches that were, you know, sort of commonplace then um, were going to be really challenging to deploy at scale. Um, so, you know, what we found early on was, look, it cost a lot of money to build these solutions. Uh, it cost a lot of money to maintain these solutions. Uh, and that was a function of the technology, not necessarily being ready for sort of, uh, you know, commercial utilization 
uh, at scale. Uh, this the solutions just didn't generalize well in terms of introducing new document types and the like, even the, even the solutions that were machine learning driven. So, right. Um, so we actually cut bait, uh, you know, fairly quickly on the, the whole doc AI problem and, you know, spent several years actually looking at a variety of technologies, um, you know, as the, uh, technical capability continued to mature. Um, but, Ultimately, at the end of the day, it was about creating business cases for our operations teams and our businesses. And if it's too expensive to, to build, uh, if you don't get high enough accuracy rates, if you can't integrate it into the business process effectively, seamlessly, such that you, know, you can actually deliver time savings in processing documents and it costs too much money to maintain, it's really hard to make a, you know, a ROI positive business case. So, um, so that's, you know, we basically searched for years to find the right technology to help us help us do that uh, and do that, you know, across a range of document types. Maybe if you could go one level deeper on why is it such a difficult technical challenge? Um, because I think that it's not a new challenge, right? It's been around for 25, 30 years. People have, you know, installed OCR. Well, why is yeah. it been so difficult? Why didn't RPA just solve it? Those kind of those kind of questions that, that I encounter when I'm talking to people. Yeah, um, you know, really, it comes down to there's just a tremendous amount of variability in in even the classes of document types. So when we think about unstructured documents, we just think about them generally as documents, and we think about them along sort of the spectrum of of structured documents. So think of tax form. Right. Uh, where the, where the uh, you know, the format and the nomenclature used in the document, um, by and large, doesn't change too much. Uh, although, you know, even a structured document has some change in multiple formats in some cases, all the way to sort of unstructured, which we think of as like a legal contract, which is, you know, written narrative uh, that, you know, really there is no format or formula to. Um, and then in between that is what we think about as semi-structured documents. So it's, it's something like an invoice or a pay stub um, where, you know, there's sort of a mix of a bunch of different things. It's sort of, there is a format to the document, but the format can vary widely. There's narrative on it, there's tables on it, there's headers, a whole slew of different things. Um, and so what we found over the course of time and testing a bunch of technologies and frankly building our own solutions is, is there's very different techniques um, that historically have been used for different classes of documents, um, you know, that range from positional type things where you build a template and template. deploy OCR and you move stuff off the document or you extract stuff off the document positionally to, you know, natural language processing type techniques that are using, uh, you know, common algorithms to, to uh, extract data out of documents. So, um, so, you know, it's just because of, of the different problems within each individual document type and then across the range of documents, it's been very hard to find uh, a single technology that is effective in, at accurately extracting information out of documents um, for an enterprise. So you, you touched on ROI. And so I'm, I'm curious what your experience has been with, with internal stakeholders and how you frame um, sort of use cases. I think that, you know, maybe a little bit, unfortunately, the industry has been been labeled automation, but, you know, automation maybe sets a tough expectation among business stakeholders who aren't as close to this, who, who think that means the machine will do it for me, right? As opposed to the machine will help me do it. Um, talk about that a little bit in terms of how how you've helped educate, you know, have you been successful educating you know, kind of business stakeholders as to what to expect with this category of use cases? Yeah, I mean, so, um, you know, basically at a bank and the processes that we're approaching, which are core operational processes, the, 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 you sort of have a binary outcome. You get 100% accurate data every single time, or you get an audit issue. Uh, you know, or a regulatory issue. So, so we have zero, zero threshold for error. So we always approach this from the perspective of this is going to be a human assist. So there will be some human in the loop that is reviewing 
you know, the output of, of the software program, the machine learning model that is identifying information in the document. Um, so, you know, and there's, there's a, there's a process to go and It doesn't have to be a hundred percent, uh, review. If you get to sort of probabilistically, uh, accuracy thresholds that, you know, ultimately you can get your operations team and your risk teams comfortable with <laughs> some kind of zero in. Yeah. Right. Um, but, um, but that's a whole process of getting the operations teams and the risk teams sort of comfortable with, uh, with going through that process. But um, yeah, but so, I mean, ultimately at the end of the day, what you're doing is a human assist. If it takes someone a minute to process a document today when they're just split screening and copying and pasting things or using hotkeys or whatever to, to extract information out of a document, um, you know, your business case is largely driven by, you know, the time savings that you can deliver by providing a, you know, a document that is pre-tagged with right. what a machine learning model or otherwise thinks is the output. Uh, so you can limit, uh, you know, sort of the keystrokes, the level of review that's required, uh, et cetera. So, um, so the key really has been um, the utmost accuracy <laughs> in actually identifying those data elements so we can actually, you know, remove the need to, you know, to have a human update something that uh, perhaps is uh, incorrect or partially correct, but it's also about integrating this into the business process and sort of the normal workflow of, of the business process in a way that's really seamless so that, you know, you're not losing time by toggling screens or, you know, loading documents or whatever it is, because frankly, the margins on these things uh, can be fairly, fairly thin. Because it is yep. just human nature for operations people to to check and double check because that's what they're incented on is, is getting these things right. It's always interesting, you know, the the first sort of questions are generally, well, how accurate is your solution? And, and my response is always that that's kind of the wrong question. The, the right question is, how difficult is it to get to 100% accuracy? That's a better framing of the question because to your point, it, it, it's not like if I say to you, Hey, it's 95% accurate. Is that good enough? You're going to say, well, no, like I, I, that means that there's 5% errors floating around the bank that, you know, one of which could cost us hundred million dollars. Right. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a subtle, but important distinction, you know, when, when you talk about accuracy. Yeah, certainly. When you think about deploying this, and I know that that's something you touched on earlier, that the sort of cost of both deploying and maintaining a, uh, have been critical issues that, that you've wanted to solve here at the bank. So how have you tackled sort of centralized versus decentralized, putting this in the hands of SMEs versus governance and compliance responsibilities? Those are intention typically. How, how have you navigated that at PNC? Yeah, I mean, so we built our team basically as uh, to be an enabler for our business and uh, you know, their traditional technical development partner. So, um, so my team works very actively with the businesses on strategy around automation and AI. So we basically ask the question like, okay, how can AI or automation enable you to achieve your strategic priorities, right? You know, AI and automation, uh, aren't necessarily almost, strategic. almost a strategy consulting kind of first step, right? In, in, in many yeah, cases. exactly. We don't think of AI and automation as strategies unto themselves. You've got business strategies and this helps to sort of accentuate or enable you to achieve that. So, so we work with the businesses on, you know, look, what are your strategic priorities? How can AI and automation help that, uh, you know, and then ultimately drill that down into individual uh, opportunities, use cases, projects, whatever you want to call them. Um, and then we work with the businesses and their uh, technology partners to stand up teams to actually deliver solutions. So, you know, the, and that's the other side of this is basically delivery enablement. So I've got subject matter experts on, on various AI technologies. Um, and I've got people who are ultimately function as subject matter experts in, in their business areas, in various business areas, that basically hand in hand work with businesses and their traditional technology partners to stand up delivery capabilities. 
so that ultimately they're self-sufficient in, um, you know, building and deploying and maintaining these types of solutions. So, so the first project we do on a document AI thing, you know, my development subject matter experts uh, will be embedded in an agile crew. Right. Uh, and essentially, you know, oversee and drive the delivery. They won't be hands on keyboards, but they'll teach, you know, the developers to actually do this. You know, the next time they do a project with that same crew, they'll be a little less hands on, right? But still overseeing. And over time, you know, they can pull themselves out of, of that. So, um, and how about on the other end of the spectrum? So, you, you know, the, the sort of, and, and that's kind of the, the tension to highlight is pushing these solutions further out into the business so they can run at their own pace, supported by, by your team. On the other end of the spectrum, you know, AI is very good at these kind of fuzzy problems like document understanding. What are the compliance folks saying when you bring AI into the organization? What, what, what kind of, how have you managed that, you know, kind of upward into the organization? Okay, we're using AI um, and they're saying back to you what in terms of uh, uh, responsibility and, and transparency? Yeah, I mean, so uh, I don't know if folks know this, but um, banks are heavily regulated. <laughs> surprise, surprise. We've got, we basically just view AI uh, and automation, you know, various automation technologies as just another technology. Like we don't have, and we actually pretty strongly believe that you don't necessarily need uh, incremental governance beyond uh, existing governance structures around operational risk, you know, technology risk, model risk, et cetera, right. data risk to, to govern AI sort of uniquely, right? So we basically have fit this into our existing uh, governance structures, um, which include all of those things, right? So at the end of the day, this is about automating process, right? And our operational risk frameworks and regimes govern you know, the requirements of what you must do in order to make changes to process and to define controls and all that sort of stuff. So we're very involved, involved with operational risk partners. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, this is just a technology. Uh, so we bring this in and we work with our technology risk partners, uh, you know, as though this were any other technology uh, that we're introducing. Same thing with, with model risk. Uh, every model that uh, we build goes through a structured process of review and verification and, you know, periodic certification that it's producing results that are, you know, appropriate. Uh, for In many ways, it's, it's sort of business. more similar to a software release process than, than dissimilar, right? Because you're still going through sort of dev stage prod. Um, you wouldn't push code into production without a, a test uh, step. And, and so models aren't that different from it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We, I mean, we follow all, all of the standard processes. It's taken us a, a long time to convince people that like, Hey, AI isn't this big, scary thing. And it's just right. not going to go take over some system, you know, but uh, I think by and large we're there. And I think by and large the, the industry, as I talk to peers, especially in banking, where there is longstanding, you know, governance and risk regimes around models and such and technology and technology change uh, that I think by and large, everyone's sort of there and sort of the same place, so. Sure. Well, the time's kind of flown by here. Uh, let me ask you one more question before we take questions. Uh, you know, if you put your, your looking glass on there and you look out into the future, do you see automation sort of converging as one thing or do you think it'll continue to be, you know, kind of best in class? I, I sort of think about RPA, process mining, document understanding, you know, you've got these things that are being talked about in the same category, but will they become, you know, uh, sort of a monolithic solution? What do you think when you, when, and what else do you see out there in the future? Yeah, I, I, I find it very hard to believe that there's going to be a monolithic solution for this. And I, I think, frankly, when we talk to our more technical, you know, sort of architecture partners, I think they uh, would suggest that's not a good thing if it, would you're going to get locked into vendors you're going to yeah. um you know build these architectures that are not as modular as you want which aren't going to enable us to drive uh sort of the ongoing iterative change that we want um by just swapping out small components of of processes and technology um 
you know, over the course of time. Uh, so I think if anything, uh, like we strongly believe, I strongly believe that uh, you need the right fit for purpose technologies to do specific things. Um, and then you deploy them, um, you know, as a part of a broader modular architecture uh, that supports a business process and, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, the, the doc AI space in particular is super challenging where uh, until recently, I don't think we've had uh, technologies that do a good job of solving necessarily any one document class, like structured or unstructured. Right. Now we've got some technologies that can span the spectrum, uh, but there's continued, uh, you know, continued innovation in that space. So we'll sort of see how that space plays out as well in terms of, you know, will there be, you know, structured document processing, semi-structured document processing, unstructured document processing, sort of specialized technologies. So, right, even I don't those know, we'll see. Are sub-segmented, yeah. Yeah, well, even great. those are sub-segmented. Uh, so, Marie, I think we've got uh, five minutes for questions. So, if there are questions from the audience, uh, that would be great. Yeah, uh, let's just give it a second. I think uh, we had one, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Marie. Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yes. We had one question come in um, that right now there's a lot of vendors right now in the marketplace uh, and they all offer different solutions. So Matthew, just for you to go through, I guess, some of the strategy and process you had in evaluating, um, how did you choose Indigo? <laughs> it was a long, long process, as Tom can attest to. Uh, even once we found Indico, um, you know, I, I think it's like any other uh, vendor selection process where you've got to be very, very clear about the business objectives, what you're trying to solve for, and then you got to, you know, sort of develop a, a a fairly deep understanding of the technical capabilities and the business requirements that uh, you know you need to assess. Uh, any technology uh, for so, you know, I always said, look, look, we want them, we want the best accuracy. We want these platforms to be scalable across document types. Um, we want these document or these technologies to be able to integrate into uh, a business process really seamlessly. Um, but most importantly, it's look we got to make sure the cost to develop is low enough for us to make business cases. We've got to make sure that there's not going to be ongoing incremental onboarding costs as document formats change and, and the like. And we got to make sure there's not, uh, you know, uh, you know, sort of, you know, uh, too much ongoing maintenance costs. Um, I think that those are like very, very generic things, <laughs> um, but that's how we sort of assessed it. Um, you know, and so with that, you know, I think it became very, very clear. The vendors didn't really like that, uh, generally speaking, because they, they wanted to like focus on very, very detailed things like, well, we can do this and they can't We're like, well, we don't really care, but, uh, you know, so, but yeah, so, I mean, that's how we did it. I mean, just set up a, a structured framework with clear business requirements, clear, uh, you know, high level technical requirements uh, in the context of the business objective and then uh, gather as much information as you can. I think it's always interesting, you know, the, the, the role of, of proof of concepts or proof of value in this space is, is so critical. I, I think even internally uh, working with Matt and his team, your internal stakeholders also like to see their own proof of concept. So it's just, it cascades, right? Everyone wants to see their own data come to life and whatever solutions being being proffered. So it, it continues to be an important part of the, the proof points. Yeah, no, and that's probably, I'd probably be remiss if I didn't, like we basically had a set of use cases that we use across the spectrum of document types from structured to semi-structured to unstructured um, that we'd run every vendor who we thought had a, you know, a chance at uh, working with us through and we were very dogmatic that we needed to have our people's hands on the keyboards and using the technology to make sure that we could actually use it. It's one thing for the vendor or their service partner to be using the technology. Uh, it's another thing for, you know, 
the customer to actually be able to to use it and uh, when we're thinking about deploying at scale. So, so uh, we did fairly exhaustive proofs of concept, more than I could uh, could actually count probably. Right, right. Well, good, Marie, if, we have, if there's more questions, we certainly are, are willing. Uh, I know we're almost at time here, so I'll leave it to you to, to I think let there us know was, on time. Yep, there was one last question um, looking at the, um, I think, Matt, you already touched upon this. It was that buy-in and that and that ROI. So we had another question pop in the box, and it was, you know, how are you building that ROI for your executive uh, leadership when you want to roll and scale? Um, and I know you probably already touched upon the different use cases. Um, how successful has that been, or or how much of leadership was you know on board from the jump? Uh, what were some of those change? management or mindset or hurdles that you needed to work with Tom to, to build that business case up? Yeah, I mean, so we, um, you know, there's business cases at a couple levels. One is, look, should we, that we need a technology like this, right? That this is a big, broad operational problem that necessitates, uh, you know, some technology investment. Um, you know, that one is, is pretty straightforward. You ask any operations team at the bank, uh, you know, what's your biggest problem? It's all these documents, uh, that exist. And basically we, you get our business processes are totally configured around processing documents. Uh, so it's, uh, that's pretty self-evident. The business case then, you know, as you sort of start applying the technology at an individual document type or a business process level, um, you know, is just doing the right diligence around, you know, document volumes and, how long does it take to process them and how can you change the process, reorder the process if you, if you actually could digitize the data and that sort of thing. And, you know, the answers become, become fairly self-evident um, as you do the work on the current state and sort of redesign the future state type thing. So, so the numbers don't lie. <laughs> Right, you can quantify it. You can, you, you, and if it's time savings, you know, you can, you can come up with a number. So it, it, uh, it is tangible. Right. Absolutely. Well, great. Uh, well, thanks, Matt. Really enjoyed it. Uh, the fascinating insights, especially you know from a business at your scale. So really appreciate, uh, really appreciate you sharing that today. And, and thanks, uh, Marie, for having us too. Thank you guys for uh, sharing all your input.